relevant on my shelf. And as I'm sure you've been warned, the tough part about the psychiatry shelf exam is not the psychiatry, right? What makes the psychiatry shelf exam tough? All the medicine. So I tried to gear this review towards the medical questions they could ask you about psychiatry. Because I know the psychiatry faculty are great. They taught you the psychiatry you need to know if you've been treating patients. Um, some of the medical stuff is where it gets tricky. So I tried to focus on that. Any questions before we get started? All right, let's party. High yield psychiatry. So, a smelly 20-year-old college kid's grades have been declining over the past two semesters. And he keeps to himself. Um, he has a flattened affect and no motivation. And for the past six weeks, he's locked himself in his dorm room, stating President Obama put a hit on him. He was told this by two voices having a discussion in his head. So, what does he have? Schizophreniform or schizophrenia? How do we tell? Time is key for all of this DSM-4 stuff. So what's the time criteria for schizophrenia? Six months, exactly. And what has to go on for six months? The positive symptoms or any symptoms? Any symptoms. And usually it's the negative ones that will, that will predate. So in this vignette, does this kid meet criteria for schizophrenia? He does. You see, for the past two semesters, he's been kind of having those negative symptoms. So the diagnosis here is schizophrenia. And more specifically, he would qualify for the paranoid type, right? He's got persecutory delusions. And the paranoid type is both the most common type of schizophrenia. Sometimes they ask about that. It's also got the best prognosis of the subtypes of schizophrenia. So um, these are some random number questions. You'll get a few of them on your shelf, incidence, prevalence, and risk for family members. So. Let's prepare ourselves for those. Prevalence in society? 1%. Very good. Between 0.5 and 1%. Good. 1% is a good guess for most of these. Have you noticed that? So between 0.5 and 1% is the prevalence of schizophrenia. How about the risk for this twin brother who brought him in? What would you say? 40. 40? Close. 50. And a sibling, a non-monozygotic sibling? It's between 1 and 50, I'll tell you that. 10, very good. So 10% risk of siblings. And the neurobiology. Now we've got to go back to Dr. Keaton's class back in the day. So where do the positive symptoms come from in schizophrenia? Too much dopamine where? In the mesolimbic tract, very good. And what about negative symptoms, where do they come from? And is it too much dopamine, or what's the story in the mesocortical tract? Not enough. Very good. That's why typical antipsychotics actually worsen negative symptoms, because they block dopamine everywhere. And when you block dopamine in the mesocortical tract, you're actually going to worsen them. So very good. Oh, no. You've seen this picture before, I'm sure. So these are the four different uh, dopamine tracts in the brain. And this is important for us, because the two that we discussed, the mesolimbic and the mesocortical, both affect the positive symptoms and the negative symptoms of depression. And the other two tracts, tubular infundibular and nigrostriatal, are going to mediate some of the side effects of antipsychotics. So just remind yourself of these little tracts um, and always be thinking when you're studying the drugs, the antipsychotics, how they're going to affect each of these tracts. And we'll see that in, in the coming slides. All right, so now we've got a patient. He's got delusions, hallucinations, and flattened affect for three weeks only. What's the diagnosis here? Yes, so this is a brief psychotic disorder. If it's more than a week but less than a month, that's the little box that that fits in. So brief psychotic disorder is the shortest duration of a, a psychotic illness. What if it lasted for three months, these same symptoms? Here's your schizophreniform. And how would we treat these? Absolutely. So we would still treat them with antipsychotics, and we'd use uh, a typical antipsychotic first. And typical antipsychotics would help this patient how? It would help the positive symptoms. Would it prevent progression to full-blown schizophrenia? No. So that's important to know. Although with schizophreniform or brief psychotic disorder, you can use typical antipsychotics to treat the positive symptoms that they're having. Uh, by blocking the dopamine receptors, it does nothing to alter the natural history of the disease. Um, to my knowledge, there's nothing that does. So, 
What if we have a patient who has persecutory delusions for the past three years, but then six months ago started having sadness, guilt, insomnia, decreased concentration, and suicidal ideation? So what's your differential diagnosis? You sick of that question yet? What's your differential? Schizoaffective. And psychotic depression, I think, would be the two on the differential. So when you're trying to determine between schizoaffective disorder and uh, depression or bipolar disorder with psychotic features, how do you tell the difference? Exactly. So which, which comes first? Which one is there in the absence of the other? So here we have psychotic symptoms in the absence of mood symptoms, so that's schizoaffective disorder. And remember that this can happen either with depression or bipolar manic episodes on top of a, a psychotic issue. Um, and the treatment, I think, is pretty logical. Since you have psychotic symptoms and you have affective symptoms, you treat them both. You treat with an antipsychotic and an antidepressant. So what about our third patient with major depressive disorder with three years and then recently begins hearing voices telling him he's worthless and to kill himself? Yeah, so here's our major depressive disorder with psychotic features. Um, oddly enough, the treatment is the same, and that makes sense if you think about it. So there's psychotic symptoms, there's affective symptoms, you have to treat them both. So the difference is really only in the label, and that has to do with what comes first or what happens in the absence of the other. Um, one thing to remember about psychotic depression is it is one of the indications for um, ECT, electroconvulsive, electroconvulsive therapy, especially if they're pregnant. Right, so a lot of those um, medicines we use to treat it are contraindicated in pregnancy. So if you see psychotic depression, that's one of the times that ECT as an answer choice would be, would be correct. So what about our fourth fellow? He's convinced Miley Cyrus is in love with him, but is otherwise functional in his day-to-day -day life. Delusional disorder, very good. So this one specifically would be the erotomanic type because it has to do with having a delusion that someone loves them that doesn't, usually someone famous. Uh, these delusions are almost always, or are always, non-bizarre. So there's something that could happen. It's not like, uh, oh, this guy thinks that aliens are coming down and stealing his children. No, it's something that's believable, non-bizarre, but still a delusion. Uh, and these are better treated with psychotherapy. You have to develop a therapeutic alliance with the patient because they don't believe what they have is a problem. They truly believe their delusion, um, hence making it a delusion. So. Any questions so far? Um, an antipsychotic. I think it would depend on, if they're functional, probably wouldn't shoot them up full of haloperidol, but since it's a type of psychotic disorder, I would assume an antipsychotic. Okay, question or hand gesture? Uh, how does, for the schizoaffective one, yes. how, does, uh, how does he fit the criteria for schizophrenia? Um, good. So the question was for y'all in Harlingen. They were questioning why my second patient met the criteria for schizophrenia. Um, and you're right, I didn't give you enough information in the vignette to, to make that. So to diagnose schizoaffective disorder, do you have to meet the criteria for schizophrenia, the psychotic symptoms, diagnostic of schizophrenia, with mood symptoms on top of it? Space was scarce in my PowerPoint, so I apologize. That was a good catch. Okay, any other questions? All right, so our agitated psychotic patient, what should we give them? Haloperidol would be the drug of choice for first line, just because it has a faster onset, and if the person is really agitated, anytime you see in a vignette, you know, you can't get the history from a patient because they're so agitated, they're hurting uh, nurses and orderlies, they're so agitated. The drug of choice is always going to be an IM drug because it's, it gets there faster, you don't have to establish IV access, and haloperidol is, has a quick onset of action. And how does haloperidol work? I think we've said it before. It's a dopamine blocker, D2 specifically. So it blocks the D2 dopamine receptor, um, and it blocks it everywhere, at each of those four tracks that we saw on one of the prior slides. So because of that, and knowing those four tracks that are there, since it blocks non-selectively, the blockade at the tubular infundibular tract is going to cause hyperprolactinemia and uh, lactation, galactorrhea, and uh, at the 
Niger's striatal tract is going to cause EPS. So knowing, knowing that neurobiology helps you answer those questions. So what are the low potency antipsychotics? Very good. And it's hard to remember those because we don't use them, right? Have you ever seen a patient on these? I don't think I did when I was on my psychiatry rotation. Um, but what to know about them for the test is that they're low potency, so they have less EPS effects, but they are more anticholinergic. So think back to Dr. Keaton in pharmacology and remember those anticholinergic side effects. If you see a patient or if you're reading about a patient on your exam that's got the dry mouth, blah, 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 uh, they may have uh, too much of this or be intolerant of one of these low potency medicines. And the high potency antipsychotics? Good, good. Hal haloperidol and fluphenicine are the ones that you'll be tested on most because they're higher potency, they have higher EPS. Um, and what if you have a patient with medication non-adherence, which is the PC term for non-compliance, just so you know. They won't take their meds. You give them some antipsychotics, uh, they're too psychotic to take them. They'll throw them away. You can give them an injection. So fluphenazine, um, is available in a, it's called the decanoate form. You can give them every two to four weeks, um, and that's good if the patient is not reliable to take an oral med. Why, why would you go with an atypical, sorry, sorry, yeah, an atypical antipsychotic here instead of doing like the Risperdal concert or something like that? So Risperdal is the other one that's available in decanoate. Decanoate is just the type of oh. injection where it's a, like a depot form, it lasts. So both haloperidol and risperdal are both available in the long-acting injectable. Okay, so decanoate is just a delivery term? To my understanding, yes. I think you can have risperdal, decanoate, and haloperidol, decanoate. That's my understanding. So these are some random side effects of some random medicines. Purple gray metallic rash over sun exposed areas and jaundice. Very good, chlorpromazine. And the prolonged QTC in pigmentary retinopathy is thioridazine. So why do we care about a prolonged QTC? Because it can lead to torsades and death. So very, it's rarely used. It's a rare side effect. We care about it, and they test you on it because it kills people. So remember these. I think one of these showed up on my shelf. I can't remember which one. OK, so a patient on an antipsychotic wakes up. Suddenly, their eyes are stuck looking up. Their head is stuck looking to the side. What's this called? Dystonic reaction. Usually, it's the earliest onset. It happens within 12 hours. Um, the treatment of this is important. You treat it with uh, benztropine or diphenhydramine. So they often ask you. They'll give you a presentation of somebody with one of these side effects and ask you how to treat it. The first treatment is obviously stop the medication that was causing it. But uh, these that I've given on the PowerPoint slides are the, the medications to treat it. Um, patients feeling like they always have to move around, akathisia, and what do you treat it with? Benzo or propanolol. You treat it with the same thing you use to treat social anxiety. That's how I remembered it. Because they're kind of restless, they're moving around, kind of like people who have social anxiety or restless. That doesn't really work. But it's the same drugs that are used to treat both. So. Um, and this onset is within one to three months. It happens a little bit later. What about a coarse resting tremor, mast facies, unsteady gait, bradykinesia, Parkinson, Parkinsonianisms, and EPS? Um, usually happens before six months, but it's later in onset. And the biggest thing here, they're going to put L-DOPA or Carbidopa or something as an answer choice. Don't pick it because it's wrong. You treat this with benztropine or diphenhydramine. Um, bromocryptine and amantadine are second line, but never, never, never. L-DOPA. Why not? Right. Why would you give a psychotic patient L-DOPA? Right? What's the problem in schizophrenia? Too much dopamine. So even though they look like a Parkinson's patient, you don't treat them like a Parkinson's patient because they're schizophrenic. So um, the latest onset side effect after 10 years, they move their tongue around, they grimace, tardive dyskinesia. And what do we use to treat it? Yeah, we can't treat it. The best we can do is stop whatever antipsychotic they're on. Um, clozip clozapine is a little bit less likely to cause it. Uh, olanzapine is also less likely to cause tardive dyskinesia. But, um, oh no, that's, that's not right, just clozapine. So clozapine is the one that's less likely to cause dis tardive dyskinesia, which is what you switch them to. So um, the one that they'll probably ask you about 
within moments of a haloperidol injection, ele elevated CPK, febrile, rigid, autonomic instability, temperature, um, blood pressure all over the place, and they're delirious. Yes, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Expect a question on that um, and know how to treat it. So obviously, look at your answer choices. If stop haloperidol is there, please pick it because it's the right answer. Um, if it's not there, look for things like dantrolene sodium, bromocryptine, um, and cooling blankets just for symptomatic treatment of the, the fever. And then remember that there are medical medicines, internal medicine medicines that can cause it also. Metoclopramide is probably the one you'll see because it's used the most. So, Okay, so which atypical agent has the highest risk of EPS and elevated prolactin? Respiradol, very good, respiridone. Um, but this one comes in a depot shot, as we discussed earlier, so that's why people still use it sometimes. Decanoate? Decanoate, yeah. So I don't, know, I don't know how high yield that one word is, but that's, I came across it in my reading. So which antipsychotic is weight neutral but pro prolongs the QTC? Ziprazidone, very good. So there are two atypical antipsychotics that are weight neutral. Ziprazidone is one. What's the other one? Starts with an A. Aripiprazole. So very good. So these two, remember these two are weight neutral. Um, Akathisia, aripiprazole, both start with an A, which is how I made that association. And then QTC is kind of like QTZ. I don't know. So, But those are the two that are weight neutral. They just have different um, side effects. So uh, the atypical associated with weight gain? Olanzapine. Olanzapine makes you eat everything. Um, and causes, causes orthostasis? Is it uh, alpha, alpha 1 blocker? Which one haven't we used? Cotiapine. So cotiapine, in addition to its atypical antipsychotic effects, also blocks alpha receptors. So it causes orthostatic hypotension. Um, and then what atypical antipsychotic is good for treatment for refractory schizophrenia? Clozapine. And what's the most common side effect of clozapine? Mm, is that the most common one? It is the most dangerous one. Yeah, so weight gain, sedation, and then the reasons why you check your patients' uh, sugar and triglycerides uh, every so often are because it can elevate lipids and sugar. The most dangerous side effect is agranulocytosis. It also decreases the seizure threshold. So we always think about what antidepressant in people with seizures or bulimics or whatever. Yeah, bupropion, but clozapine also decreases the seizure, seizure threshold. Um, and for monitoring, we want to check a CBC to make sure we catch agranulocytosis and stop the medicine if the white blood cells go too low. Okay, so we have a woman complaining of decreased appetite, five pound weight loss, doesn't enjoy knitting, she's got insomnia, no energy, can't concentrate, feels guilty, all for two weeks. What does she have? She's depressed, yes. Yeah. So this is a depressive episode. What's the most important first question for this patient? Very good. You assess for suicidal ideation first, uh, just because you always want to think when you're asking questions or planning your workup, what's going to kill the patient? In suicide, that would be, I mean, in depression, that would be suicide. So risk factors for suicide? Oh, press your button and say it again. Previous uh, history of suicide? Very good, Harlingen. That's the most important uh, risk factor, is a prior attempt, prior attempt of suicide. But everything you said comes right after. Single white male, lives at home, unmarried, divorced. Um, yeah, alcohol, firearms, have a plan. All of those are other risk factors. But the most important one, if you get a question asking for the most important risk factor, it's prior attempt. Oh, you know all of them. Look at you. <laughs> okay, so here are some kind of random medical questions they might ask. In a depressed person, person, what happens to their sleep? What might you see on a polysomnogram? Yes, so, wait, what did you say? Yeah, so you have a, a shortened REM latency. That means it takes less time from when your head hits the pillow to when REM sleep starts. Um, and there's also more frequent, frequent REM. 
So does that make sense why depressed people are tired and fatigued all the time? They got more REM. Yeah, so remember, and we'll get to sleep in a little bit, but three and four sleep is the most restful and restorative. REM sleep, you're, you know, your eyes are moving all over the place. It's, it's like being awake. So I think, I think it makes sense why they're short in REM latency and more frequent REM. Um, and this is kind of random, but an atypical lab test in people with depression. It's not really used clinically, um, but it's a hormone level that's high in patients with depression. It is cortisol. So the dexamethasone suppression test is abnormal. Their cortisol level is high, so when you give dexamethasone, it doesn't suppress in the blood. And medications that might cause depression, there's a whole bunch of them. Give me some main ones. Beta blockers, Beta blockers interferon ga gamma, and alpha methyl dopa are the three big ones. There are a laundry list of others. Um, and then don't forget drugs of abuse. You can't diagnose depression unless somebody is off drugs and done detoxing from drugs. And medical diseases that cause depression, again, there's a laundry list. Um, it kind of depends on what other symptoms they give you in the vignette. HIV, you know, they tell you about the risk factors, seroconversion disorder. If a tick bit them, think Lyme. Uh, always check thyroid. That's one of the first medical tests you take. Porphyria, if they've got abdominal pain or uh, uh, joint pain or a photosensitive rash, that's probably porphyria. Uh, uremia, if they have kidney failure and so forth, so forth and so on. So those are kind of the big ones. Oh, left middle cerebral artery stroke. That was a question in pretest that I got wrong like 85 times in a row. So I decided to put it on my slide. A left middle cerebral artery stroke gives the patient symptoms of depression. Okay, first line drugs for major depressive disorder. SSRIs, they're our best friend in psychiatry. Um, other indications for SSRI are OCD, bulimia, anxiety, PTSD, and premature ejaculation. Poor K. Why premature ejaculation? Well, think about one of the side effects of SSRIs. Yeah, so it, it decreases um, ejaculation, so you can actually use it in the treatment of premature ejaculation. I haven't seen it used, but it's in the books. So which SSRI has the most drug-drug interactions? Paroxetine, very good. It has the most interactions with cytochrome P450, so more drugs will cause problems. Uh, what drug don't you have to taper when stopping? Fluoxetine, and why is that? It has the shortest half-life, so you don't have to worry about um, serotonin discontinuation, or SSRI discontinuation syndrome. Which one has the fewest drug-drug interactions? Very good, citalopram. And if your patient was on an SSRI and gets headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, fatigue, when they stopped it suddenly, which one might they be taking? Sertraline and fluvoxamine. Sertraline is probably the one they'll ask you about. So this is serotonin discontinuation syndrome. It's kind of feel like they have the flu. Isn't uh, fluvoxamine or Rubox only indicated for OCD? Uh, for That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, it was listed with the SSRIs, so I put it in the SSRIs section. But I, don't, I didn't come across it in my reading, and I don't know. Sorry. But I trust you if you say that's true. Harlingen, he said that fluvoxamine is only indicated for OCD and not for MDD, but I don't know about that. How long is it in the pharmacopoeia? Apparently it's in pharmacopoeia. So the reason I made a presentation Well, then I trust you. Okay, so what if your patient has myoclonic jerks, tachycardia, high blood pressure, hyperreflexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea? What does that sound like? Uh, serotonin syndrome. So you might get this with a high dose of an SSRI or if you combined SSRI, SSRI and MAOI. Um, and we talked about loss of ejaculation and erection. Uh, what should we switch them to? Bupropione. Very good. And the mechanism of that, it's dopamine, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitor. When can't you prescribe bupropione? Yeah, seizures. So if someone's epileptic, if they're alcoholic, because they're at risk for DTs and withdrawal seizures, or if they're bulimic, because their electrolytes get all screwy when they're throwing up all the time. Uh, erection lasting more than three hours? Yeah, trazodone. See a doctor, but it's probably caused by trazodone. Um, which antidepressant is good for old, skinny, sad ladies? Mirtazapine, very good, because it increases appetite, is sedating, 
uh, and has antidepressant properties. Very good. What antidepressant should you avoid in hypertensive patients? Venlafaxine, very good. You also shouldn't take it with St. John's wort. There were a couple questions on my shelf asking about drug interactions with common herbs. Um, this is the only one I found in my book, so I put it on there. So St. John's wort and an SNRI can cause a hypertensive crisis. And our last patient, pounding head, flushing nausea, myoclonus, after they ate some cheese and drank some wine. Yeah, so that's a hypertensive crisis with MAOI. Um, and you treat that with an alpha blocker because it's the excess of norepinephrine that's causing these symptoms, and alpha blocker IV is the treatment. Okay, so we got a little kid. He ate some pills out of grandma's purse. Grandma, these are her med medical conditions, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, fibromyalgia, insomnia, peptic ulcer disease. This kid now has dry mouth, tachycardia, vomiting, urinary retention, and seizures. And an EKG, I know you're thinking, I'm not in medicine. I don't need to know EKGs. So they probably wouldn't give you the EKG. What they would tell you is that there's widened QRS complexes and a prolonged QT interval. What did the kid get into? A tricyclic. Very good. So I didn't say grandma had depression, but TCAs are also indicated for insomnia and fibromyalgia. So grandma's taken a tricyclic. The kid ate the tricyclic. And what's going to kill him? Yeah, an arrhythmia. Torsades from the prolonged QTC. And we treat it with? Charcoal, if you get them in time, and then uh, sodium bicarbonate helps the metabolic acidosis and is somewhat cardioprotective. So that's the treatment. Okay, so a patient, they're sad, they're eating a lot, gaining weight, sleeping more, and the buzzword is let in paralysis in the morning. That's atypical depression. I don't know what the lead in paralysis is about, but that's the buzzword for atypical depression. Also, they sleep more and eat more instead of regular depression where they usually eat less and sleep less. Uh, and this is a good indication for MAOIs. Uh, if we've got a patient one month after the death of her child, feels guilty, can't sleep, concentrate, eat, or enjoy her interests. Good, bereavement. So this is uncomplicated bereavement. It's expected based on the loss that this woman suffered. Um, and she does not have suicidal ideation or psychosis. So remember the little caveats in this DSM diagnosis. Thoughts of death are okay if the mom wants to be with the child, thinks about what if it were me and not my child. Those types of thoughts are normal, but suicidal ideation, uh, plain and simple, is not normal. Um, hearing the child's voice in the nighttime is normal, but frank psychosis is not normal. So this woman would qualify for uncomplicated bereavement. Remember, this is one of the few things that goes on the V code. It's not a mental disorder, so it's not an axis one. It goes on the V code of DSM-4. What about our last lady? Four months after the death, death of her chihuahua, she feels guilty, can't sleep, concentrate, eat, or enjoy her interests. She started feeling this guilty two months after her chihuahua died. What did you say? Pathological grief or adjustment disorder. Yeah, so... Um, so the DSM, the DSM term is adjustment disorder, and the symptoms have to start within three months of the stressor, can't last longer than six months of the stressor, and must be out of proportion with what would normally occur. Uh, so think about, think about this. Usually they'll describe a child that goes away to college and has problems adjusting, so they call it adjustment disorder. Uh, but the symptoms stop just short of major depressive episode. Okay, and this is one of the indications for psychotherapy a good therapeutic alliance, um, and working through the issues with adjustment disorder. Okay, so a patient is brought in by his identical twin brother, stating he's been sleeping little, had sex with lots of ladies, talks in a pressured manner, maxed his, out his credit cards, he's starting a business that couldn't fail. What does he have? Bipolar uh, manic face. Yeah, so this is a manic episode. We don't know if he's had any depression, uh, but definitely a manic episode, possibly bipolar, if we, if we see cycling. Um, incidents in the general population. What's the magic number? So it's 1% incidence. Uh, risk for diagnosis in this identical twin brother? 90, yeah. Bipolar disorder is one of the most heritable psychiatric conditions ever. So... 90% uh, concordance rate within uh, monozygotic twins. 
And what would we think if the same symptoms happened in a 75-year-old man instead of this, uh, I didn't say how old he was, but you know, someone in their 20s? So it could be PICS, it could be frontotemporal dementia. There's definitely loss of inhibition. You can see some of these issues. In general, you'd be looking for something more medical. We'd feel more comfortable calling this a manic phase in someone who's maybe 20 or 30 than someone who is 70 or 80. So always remember in older patients with new psychiatric symptoms, it's probably medical. So a right frontal hemispheric stroke can also cause symptoms of mania. Remember the left MCA gave you depression, the right MCA gives you mania if you have a stroke there. Uh, what medication should we avoid in this fellow? SSRIs, very good, or TCAs. They can both trigger a manic phase. And medications to start? Lithium. Lithium is agitated, you can't complete your history. It's an indication for haloperidol or a typical antipsychotic. So this guy, I don't know if I made a convincing In the vignettes, you'll see on your exam, you know, the patient's too pressured, you can't interview them, um, you give them haloperidol first, and then start a maintenance medicine. So this dude has taken Advil for some muscle cramps and develops nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, coarse tremor, ataxia, confusion, and slurred speech. And you started him on a medicine for his bipolar a couple months ago. I hear whispers. This is lithium toxicity. This is textbook lithium toxicity. So the coarse tremor, the ataxia, uh, problematic gait, confusion and slurred speech um, is classic for lithium toxicity, and it's classically precipitated by NSAIDs. So the two that are safe that don't precipitate toxicity are aspirin and Sulindac, which I have never seen used, but it's in the book. So aspirin, probably the one you'll see. Uh, possible EKG findings in lithium toxicity. There are two EKGs you need to know. The prolonged QRS is for TCA overdose. What's the one for lithium toxicity? What about T waves? Yes, so flattened T waves or U waves. It kind of looks like hypokalemia, if, um, if you've come across that before. So T wave flattening or T wave inversion or U waves are the classic findings on an EKG for lithium overdose. And how do we treat it, lithium overdose? Yes, so dialysis, if the levels are over four, um, if the levels are not over four, like maybe there are two, then you can just give them fluids, hope for the best. So major side effects of lithium. These are bad, right? Weight gain, acne, GI irritation, and cramps. Those are the more common side effects of lithium. Um, the mechanism of lithium it's unknown therapeutically, but uh, biologically, it suppresses something called inositol triphosphate. Don't know how high yield that was. That was a pre-test question I came across one time. So, but you're right, the therapeutic mechanism is unknown. They're not sure why it helps bipolar. For therapeutic levels, 0.6 to 1.2 is what I have. And medical monitoring, what lab tests do you want to get periodically? Renal function. Thyroid function, because it can cause hypothyroidism. Sodium levels? Mm, yeah. True. I don't have on that, but I, I agree with you. Uh, checking a basic chemistry couldn't hurt either. The ones that I had in my book, you always want to check the lithium level to make sure they're therapeutic. TFTs to look for hypothyroidism, um, creatinine to check kidney function, a UA, CBC, and EKG periodically. So. Contraindications for use, mainly because it precipitates toxicity. Oh. Okay, so lack of AC, why is that? Oh, I see. I had not heard uh, no air condition as a contraindication, but I believe you. Severe renal disease is the one they'll usually ask you about just because it decreases clearance. So if, you're, if your creatinine is high, if your, your GFR sucks, you're not going to be able to clear lithium and you're going to be more prone to toxicity. Um, also, pregnant and breastfeeding, not a good idea to take lithium. Problems in pregnancy, why can't our pregnant friends take lithium? 
It's a dead guy's name on a heart malformation, Epstein's anomaly. So what that is, is part of the right ventricle becomes atrialized um, and it, it decreases cardiac output from the right side of the heart. So usually the problem is in the first trimester. Okay, so what should we treat bipolar with in pregnant people? Can we use valproic acid? Carbamazepine causes a lot of the same um, birth defects as valproic acid. So actually, you use a benzo. It's always a risk-benefit analysis. You talk to the patient, but textbook, the best choice for treatment of bipolar is a benzo because it doesn't cause the same birth defect risk. Um, so if side effects are elevated LFTs and hepatitis, what bipolar med is that? There's your valproic acid. Uh, stevens johnson syndrome, what side effect is that? Lamotrigine, very good. Car carbamazepine a little bit. I don't think they could give you lamotrigine and carbamazepine as answer choices for this, because technically it happens in both, but lamotrigine is more classic. Um, agranulocytosis, there's your carbamazepine. You also need to check the CBC. Um, and if it's less than 2,000, watch closely every week. If it's less than 1,000, absolute neutrophil count, stop it. Got to change to something else. Um, so a bipolar lady gets pregnant and has elevated alpha feta protein at her 20-week checkup. What drug might have caused that? Good. So it's either valproic acid or carbamazepine because elevated AFP means a neural tube defect. So I know you're like, that's unfair. I haven't taken OB-GYN. Sorry, it might be on the shelf. So now you know. <laughs> Valproic acid and carbamazepine. Um, and the recommendation is anybody on these medications needs to take four grams of folic acid to help prevent a neural tube defect. So the most common co complication of carbamazepine? Ooh, that's good. I had rash, but it does have a lot of drug-drug interactions. Um, in my book, the most common complication was rash from carbamazepine. It, the, a lot of people have drug interactions with it. Um, I believe you. <laughs> okay. So what about therapeutic acids of valproate? Very good. So we move the decimal point over, right? Is the same chief resident still here that teaches this? He used to say you just move the decimal point one place over. So it was 0.6 to 1.2. Valproic acid is 6 to 12. So what do you think carbamazepine is? 60 to 120. So you just move the decimal point over one place for each one. Okay, we got a patient. She's 28 years old. She's brought in by EMS complaining of shortness of breath, palpitations, chest pain, smokes a pack per day, takes OCPs, uh, birth control pills, and had one of these attacks previously while grocery shopping. And she shares with you that she is so afraid of having another one of these that she rarely leaves the house. So what's her deal? What's her diagnosis? Panic disorder with agoraphobia, right? Because she's telling you that she's afraid to leave her house. So what's your next best step since you suspect panic disorder? Do an EKG, very good. Medical workup first. You know, this lady is young. You're not thinking heart disease, but she is a smoker on birth control pills. She could have a clot or a stroke or a pulmonary embolism. So anytime, even if you're pretty sure they give you a really convincing picture for panic disorder, Always rule out the medical stuff first. Um, scan your answer choices. If you see one that's medically related, that's probably the one they're looking for you to pick. So EKG is first, cardiac enzymes, um, echo if necessary. Always check TSH and T4 and always check for drugs. When is assessment for a GMC not the first step in evaluating a patient? I can't think of one, to be honest with you. If it's, if it's there, unless they've already done it, Unless they give you in the, in the question stem that they've already done it or they've already ruled it out. Um, remember on these tests, we're supposed to trust our patients. So if they tell you the 17-year-old boy doesn't do drugs, then your intox screen is not the right answer. So in, in general, on standard, in, in life, heck no, check the P. But on exams, um, you kind of have to take what they give you in the question stem for, for fact unless they're shady about it. Like, the kid is in his room a lot, but he says he's not doing drugs, but his parents notice that he's, you know, blah, blah, blah. So 
It, they, they make it obvious, though. They have to. Okay, drug regimen of choice for Our Lady once we've ruled out all her medical stuff. What, what? Beta blocker, not for panic disorder. For social phobia, yes. But for panic disorder, it's one of those indications for a benzo, at least in the short term. SSRIs are drug of choice, but they do take a while to work. That's why we tell our patients we've got to give it four to six weeks to take effect. Um, you can give them benzos to bridge. Remember the contraindications for benzodiazepines. That comes up um, pretty regularly. Anybody with a history of addiction can't give them to. COPD people and restrictive lung disease people. Why is that? Benzodes uh, d suppress the respiratory drive. Very good. So we can't give them to anybody with lung disease. So if our lady, we gave her some benzos and we gave her an SSRI, um, we gave her a lot of benzos. We gave her a six months prescription to, of benzos and she's brought in three months later with symptoms um, including a temperature of 101, convulsions, confusion, hypertension, and she tells you she recently lost her prescription drug coverage. What's up with her? She's in withdrawal. So remember benzodiazepine withdrawal looks just like DTs. So they'll have the um, autonomic instability, they can have uh, seizures, hallucinations, it's a serious deal. So treat them just like you would somebody in DTs with diazepam or chlorodiazepoxide. Okay, MS4 with a deathly fear of flying that inhibits her from interviewing at the program of her dreams. What does she have? It's a specific phobia. And treatment? So good. If desensitization, if exposure therapy is there, that's the right answer. Uh, this is another indication for benzos. You can give them a really small prescription and tell them to take one when they go on an airplane. So um, good. What about an MS3 with a deathly fear of presenting a case in Grand Rounds because she's afraid the surgeons will laugh at her? And they will. Just kidding, they won't. What's that? <laughs> Social phobia. Good. So here's your propranolol. Propranolol is good for the um, autonomic symptoms, the sweating, tremors, such and such. Uh, you can also give a situational benzo. Um, and MS2 keeps to herself because she doesn't and doesn't talk with peers because she's afraid they'll laugh at her. Good. This is a personality disorder, avoidant personality disorder, and the treatment here is cognitive behavioral therapy. So the difference between social phobia and avoidant personality disorder is in presentation type settings versus any social setting. Just one-on-one -on -one in a small group, group of friends, um, that's the difference. So what about an MS1? Trouble falling asleep, she thinks about failing biochem. In class, she can't concentrate, she worries her boyfriend will leave her. This has been going on for six months. That's generalized anxiety disorder. So remember buspirone as a drug of choice here. Um, but it takes, it takes a while to work. It's okay to give a benzo bridge. So, now, I've got an 18-year-old who just started college, um, and his grades are declining. He states he can't make it to class on time because he spends two to three hours scrubbing in the shower each morning. He knows this is excessive, but on days he takes shorter showers, he can feel the bacteria and worries about contracting an illness. So he's OCD and comorbid condition. Tourette's, good. Vocal motor tics, um, for sure. And then full-blown full blown Tourette's is in about Tourette's is in about 5%. So how do we treat OCD, drug of choice? The gold standard in most of the books that I read is still clomipramine. Um, and SSRIs are what's used first line. So this is the first line versus gold standard thing. Um, so read your question carefully. I think... I think I would pick clomipramine if both of them were, were answer choice, and I think I did because I got this question. They don't tell you which ones you got right and which ones you got wrong, but I did really well on the shelf, so I go with clomipramine. <laughs> okay, so we've got a 25-year-old survivor of sexual assault. She comes to you with a six-week history of recurrent nightmares when she was raped at knife point. She now avoids situations where unknown men will be present to the point that she had to quit her job at a bank. She reports being jumpy anytime she hears footsteps behind her. So this is, this qualifies as PTSD. And you'll see I have in purple um, recurrent nightmares. Those are the reliving symptoms. So you have reliving symptoms, you have hyperarousal, and you have avoidance. So this woman has, has all three of those. And it's interfering with her day-to-day -day life. 
So how would we treat PTSD? SSRIs, very good. Uh, usually most effective when you combine it with therapy. And remember these random alpha blockers are good for nightmares. If you did any rotations at the VA, you know that a lot of the PTSD guys are on either prazosin or terazosin, um, and those are helpful for nightmares, their alpha-1 uh, blocking ability. So, good. So what if we had the same symptoms but only present for three weeks? This is this time thing again. Acute stress reaction, very good. Um, and the same symptoms, but instead of being in response to rape, being in response to a bad breakup. This is adjustment disorder again. So it's out of proportion to what you would expect for a situation. Um, onset within three months, lasting no longer than six months. So the criteria for adjustment. Okay. Question. Of course. Do you remember after what time period is no longer acute stress when it becomes PTSD? Like, what do So the question for Harlingen is the time criteria between acute stress reaction and PTSD. And off the top of my head, I think it's three months, but let me look it up because I don't want to lie to you. So okay, so acute stress disorder must begin within four weeks. Um, so it's got to be before a month. And so then PTSD, did someone, did someone get the answer before me? You don't have to wait for me. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the first state, and uh, for acute stress disorder, it has to be within one month. So right. less than one month. And for post-traumatic stress disorder, um, the symptoms have to last uh, one month. Okay, so one month is the cutoff. So less than one month, it's acute stress. More than one month, it's PTSD. That was good teamwork, guys. Thank you, Harlingen. So we just got a comment, Harlingen, that delayed onset PTSD can present six months after the, the stressor. And that happens a lot with veterans. So, Okay, so we've got a 33-year-old female. She's got pelvic pain during menses. You review her chart and see that she's also sought help over the past 10 years for pain in her low back, neck, arms, feet, constipation. What does she have? So it's a type of somatoform disorder. I'm setting you up for somatization disorder, but do you have enough diagnostic criteria? What's missing? She's constipated. Neurologic. So you need a, a neurologic symptom. So the criteria for somatization disorder, it's got to start before age 30, um, four pain, one GI, one sexual, and pain like a, uh, painful menses or uh, heavy cramping, that counts as a sexual um, effect, and then a pseudoneurological symptom. So uh, uh, blindness, um, tingling, usually it's tingling or numbness along an arm or something. So this lady doesn't have a pseudoneurological symptom, so we can't diagnose her with somatization disorder. Uh, if she did have somatization disorder, what would be some comorbid conditions you would worry about? Yeah, usually it's depression or anxiety on axis one, and almost all of them have a personality disorder. And the best treatment for somatization disorder? Frequent follow-up. Very good. So you appoint one physician for the patient, um, schedule frequent visits with this doctor, and make sure there's an agreement with all the doctors caring for the patient that they won't do unnecessary tests, only if they're warranted. Yes, sir? Could you give them the So the question was, would on our differential also be opiate addiction for a patient with um, these symptoms? On a standardized test, they'd have to tell you that they asked for them or there was a history that they had them. I don't think, in life, sure. In life, this patient walks in, absolutely. But on your exam, they'd have to give you more than that. So that's, that's where it's, it's easy to get into trouble on shelf exams, that you start thinking that the clinical vignettes are real people because unfortunately, you treat a clinical vignette on a test and a real patient very differently. And it sucks, but it's important to put your test hat on when you walk into the shelf exam so you don't overthink questions. So, okay. 
Um, so what about another 33-year-old female brought into the ER after having a seizure in the waiting room of her neurologist's office? Hmm. Her worried husband describes the episode as lasting 20 minutes, consisting of shaking with her eyes closed. She didn't pee on herself. She didn't poo on herself. What are we thinking? Pseudo-seizure, and that's a type of what, axis one? Conversion disorder. Very good. So, um... Conversion disorders aren't intentional. They're a manifestation of something underlying. So that's something that they might ask you. This person did not, um, or if it, if it is true conversion disorder, the person is not sitting there saying, I'm going to shake like this and fake the seizure to get out of going to jail, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, this is unintentional, and you, used, you should always view it as a cry for help and look for something underlying, depression or anxiety. Uh, and in the textbooks, they, they use the term la belle indifference. So the patient you know, can't see but doesn't care, or their foot is paralyzed and they don't care, that's not always true. So even the textbooks say in, in uh, test questions, it's not always true. So, um, and why do we think this is a pseudo-seizure and not a real one? Eyes closed. It's kind of long, right? A 20-minute seizure, you'd be pretty worried about that if that were real. She didn't pee on herself. And it happened in the waiting room of her neurologist's office. Come on now. I mean, seizures are so random, what's the likelihood that's going to happen in a witness situation where there are medical people around? So um, if we wanted to confirm or support that it was a pseudo-seizure and not a real one, what test could we do? So we could do an EEG. They could do like a, a prolonged study um, to see, to confirm that there's no uh, uh, abnormal electrical discharge. Prolactin is also something that in the textbooks they say you can check after a seizure. If it's a real seizure and you've got real muscle contraction, the prolactin should be sky high. In pseudo-seizures, it's usually lower. That's not perfect because if you're having a real good pseudo-seizure, theoretically you could contract enough to make your prolactin go up. But in the textbooks, they say that prolactin can be a, a determining factor. High in real seizures, normal in pseudo. Okay, so a 54-year-old RN presents with a history of two months, diarrhea and abdominal pain. He's presented to four other hospitals with the same complaint. Colonoscopy reveals pigment in the wall of the colon. So we've got a vote for malingering. Yeah, so we suspect he's using laxatives. Um, this pigmentation in the wall of the colon, you don't need to know this, it's called melanosis coli and it's black deposition of pigments that happens when you take too many laxatives. So this guy is giving himself diarrhea, so what do we call it? So it's Munchausen's, it's not simple factitious disorder because he is making himself sick. So it's, it's similar to factitious disorder because it's for primary gain and not secondary, but in simple factitious disorder, they just say, uh, you know, oh, I... Um, I have a headache or I have uh, abdominal pain. You know, they have complaints, but they're not physically doing something to themselves to cause the symptoms. If they're inducing the symptoms voluntarily with an action, it's called Munchausen. And this is Munchausen and not Munchausen by proxy because he's doing it to himself and not to someone else. So um, what about our second lady? Concerned mother presents with her 15-month-old baby having recurrent seizures, requests an MRI sleep-deprived EEG with intracranial leads. So now we're, we're suspecting Munchausen by proxy. Again, it's Munchausen and not factitious because this baby's having seizures. The lady is doing something to the baby to cause the seizures. Um, and in this case, it's probably giving insulin. If someone's a diabetic in the house, uh, giving insulin can make a patient hypoglycemic and cause seizures um, or you, otherwise causing them. So this is a form of child abuse. Your next step should be to alert the Child Protective Services. Okay, so our last patient is a 45-year-old unemployed man involved in a car accident. Sues the driver, stating he has nerve damage to his legs that keeps him from walking. But video evidence shows him dancing at a club the night before. Here's malingering. And, you know, they, the thing is, on the test, they just have to be real clear. They have to be real clear that there's a secondary gain, because otherwise you can't call it. You can't diagnose it. So here there's a lawsuit. Sometimes it's a prisoner trying to go to the hospital and not stay in prison. Um, trying to get, uh, what's it called, disability. 
So those are all keywords that should make you think of malingering. And again, this is not a psychiatric diagnosis. This goes on the V-code. So what else have we seen that goes on V-code? Bereavement goes on V-code and malingering. I think those are the only two we've come across so far. So there are not that many. So it's important to remember those things that aren't an official access one diagnosis that go on the V-code instead. Yes? Well, the fact, I was, what I was trying to, to get at with the question is that the woman is very pushy about asking for invasive tests. Intracranial leads are pretty invasive. Um, they require a surgery to put them in. They may need to tell you that the woman had access to insulin also. You're right, there may be a few other clues if it were real in life. Um, and you, you could also use your answer choices to help you because if there wasn't anything else that fit, then you kind of have to make the diagnosis with what you have. But you're right. I think the, the real vignette would be a little bit longer than the space I had here, and they might give you a few more details. Good question. Okay, 18-year-old female, no menstrual cycle for three months. Pregnancy test is negative, but her BMI is 17. Teeth are eroded, has calluses on her knuckles. This is called a Russell sign. What does she have? But she's barfing. Doesn't she have bulimia? She has amenorrhea, and that is evidence of an endocrine abnormality, and she's also got a BMI that's abnormal. So even though she's barfing, she's not bulimic. She's an anorexic purging type. So anytime you have any endocrine abnormalities, usually that's amenorrhea. It could also be osteoporosis. Sometimes these girls will present with a pathologic fracture in the femur or something like that, and then they do a bone scan, and they have osteoporosis. Um, that's another endocrine symptom that makes it anorexia and not bulimia. So what abnormalities would you expect in your bulimic or our, our anorexic patient that's barfing? This is the medical stuff that I can almost guarantee you they'll ask a question about. How are her vital signs? Yeah, so she's bradycardic, hypotensive, hypothermic. Everything is decreased. And it makes sense, hypothermia, she doesn't have body fat, um, bradycardia, hypotension makes sense, she's throwing up, so she's hypovolemic. So what about our CBC? What do we expect about her white blood cells? Low. So she'll be leukopenic, uh, which actually predisposes these patients to infections. So it's, it counts as kind of a, um, what's it called? I don't know. They're susceptible to infections. So on chemistry, this is where most of the questions will be. What's up with the potassium? Low. What's up with the magnesium? Low too, I think. Oh no, that's not on there. But the chloride is low um, because of the vomiting, and the bicarb is high as part of the metabolic alkalosis due to the vomiting. So it's a hypochloremic, um, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. The carotene is high, uh, which you may see. LFTs are high, and there's also high amylase, especially since she is the purging type. So. Um, high LFTs because the liver is struggling to generate glycogen um, and the liver becomes stressed. So high LFTs. What about the TFTs? The thyroid function test, sorry. Thyroid function test. This is kind of a trick question. This is one of the only things that's normal in anorexics. Almost everything else is out of whack, but if they ask you about the, TF, the thyroid function test, um, the thyroid hormone, TSH, all of those are normal. And you would kind of think there would be something wrong with them because the metabolism, but they're normal. So remember that. Um, what about lipids? They're high, hypercholesterolemia. Hormones? What about cortisol, high or low? Cortisol's high. What about estrogen, high or low? Estrogen's low, that's why amenorrhea. What about LH and FSH? Low also, low also. Very good. So it's hypogonadism from the top. So low LH and FSH leads to low estrogen, leads to amenorrhea. Okay, long-term complications. That's not a very good question. What I'm looking for is osteoporosis because um, decreased estrogen kind of leads to premature menopause. So like I said, some of these girls can present with um, 
stress fra or not stress fractures, but fragility fractures. Mm -hmm. So that's in response to the hypothermia. The question was, what about the downy hair, the lanugo or lanago, whatever it's called? That's, that's another sign. That may be something that they tell you along with the callus knuckles and all that business in the vignette. With the protein type, do they get the same kind of parotitis that the women They sure do. If they're throwing up every day, they are prone to parotitis, just like they're prone to the erosion of the teeth enamel. So, uh, Most common cause of cat death in anorexics? Heart disease, very good. So arrhythmia is number one. Second, however, is suicide, and that's kind of sad. So heart disease is number one. Suicide is number two. And treatment of anorexia, what do we need to do for this girl? She needs to be admitted. Very good. So this girl um, meets criteria for admission. She needs to receive nutrition. If she'll eat, you can give it to her orally. You might need to give her TPN. Um, the one thing you need to look out for, especially with TPN, this complications of treatment, is something called refeeding syndrome. This is something you'll hear more about in surgery. It's kind of a surgery issue, like people with Crohn's disease and eat a lot of TPN after they haven't been eating. Uh, but you might see it in the context of treatment for anorexia. And what refeeding syndrome is, is fluid retention that causes low potassium and low magnesium and low calcium. And that can cause arrhythmias in and of itself. Phosphate. Yes, phosphate. What did I say? Phosphorus? Phosphate. PO4. Okay, so sorry if these are random. I'm trying to get at the little medical factoids you might not have seen. Okay, so let's talk about sleep. You might see an EEG on your shelf, um, and you should be able to pick out the characteristics of the different stages in sleep. So it, it might be a little bit blurry, um, but what do you think about that first one? It's pretty low amplitude and high frequency, no real, like, special waves or characteristics? I'll give you this one. It's awake. <laughs> so this is the EEG of awake. It's, it's misleading because I say they're sleep EEGs. So that's awake before you go to sleep. Um, then what if you see either see on the EEG or here described theta waves, which are these guys, where the frequency decreases and the amplitude increases a little bit? Stage one. Stage one. Sleep two is characterized by these um, sleep spindles and K-complexes. So sleep spindles are when we have an increase in frequency. K-complexes are when we have an increase in amplitude. And these are hallmarks of stage two sleep. Um, these guys right here are theta waves. Uh, I'm sorry, are delta waves, where they slow way down in frequency and increase way up in amplitude. So these are delta waves, and these are characteristics of three and four. So both of those are slow wave sleep, um, and the only difference is the amount of theta waves. If there's more than 50%, that's stage four. If there's less than 50%, that's stage three. And for uh, a clinical correlate, what they might ask you about is sleepwalking, sleep talking, and night terrors all occur during slow wave sleep. Okay. And lastly here, it kind of looks like the awake EEG, but you see these things that might be described as sawtooth waves. Looks like awake REM. So it's the only one left, right? It's REM. Um, and remember that your skeletal muscle is paralyzed, except for your extraocular muscles in REM sleep. So remind me, how does your sleep EEG change in depression? Decrease REM latency. Decrease REM latency, and you spend more time in REM. Very good. What about old people? Yeah, so it's more rapid cycling, and I think decreased latency also. It looks similar to a depressed picture. Uh, but remember, in old people, they have the same amount of sleep overall. They just sleep less during the night and then take more naps. So long as in the clinical vignette, they tell the old person comes in, they're like, oh my gosh, I go to sleep at 10, I wake up at 2 a.m. every day. Uh, and then the doctor says, okay, well, do you sleep in the day? The patient's like, yeah, I take a four-hour nap every afternoon. That's not pathologic, right? That's just normal age-related sleep changes. So, Okay, what if our patient has trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, and it causes an impairment of function, and it lasts more than a month? That's insomnia. So we treat it. First, remember, always go non-medical. So have a little powwow with your patient, discuss good sleep hygiene, no TV in the bedroom, uh, you know, lay there with your eyes closed, discuss sleep hygiene first, and then you can try benzos, 
but it's better to use a specific GABA-A receptor agonist like Zolpidem, Zaloplon, um, or that E1 that I can never pronounce. So what if we have a patient who, as they're falling asleep, feel these little creepy crawlies on their legs? And it gets better when they get out of bed and walk to the kitchen for a snack. Sounds like restless leg syndrome. What's the AXIS-1 diagnosis, though? Restless, links, restless, restless leg syndrome is not an AXIS-1 diagnosis. It's called dysomnia, not otherwise specified. Kind of cheap, I know. But dysomnia, not otherwise specified, encompasses both restless leg syndrome and periodic leg movement disorder. Remember the difference is restless leg syndrome, you feel creepy crawly, so you have to move. Periodic leg movement, PLS, periodic leg something, uh, is when you have these random kicking motions while you're sleeping. My husband says I have this. I'm not really sure. So remember with restless leg syndrome, I, I had a hard time remembering this. There are medical causes for it, but like everything in psychiatry, you have to rule out first. So the test you'll order here is an iron panel because iron deficiency anemia can cause symptoms of restless leg syndrome. Um, the other thing that can cause it is chronic kidney disease, but you'd think the patient would know that. So check an iron panel, then check a creatinine to rule out the medical causes. The treatments here um, are dopamine agonists, so similar for Parkinson's uh, drugs, ropinirole or pramipexol. And oddly enough, I just read when I was studying for step two, ropinirole, one of the side effects is pathologic gambling. Why does that make sense? The dopamine agonist, so, you know, it's the pleasure reward center, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. I don't think that's going to be on your test. I just thought it was interesting. So, okay. Um, daytime sleepiness and depression in a big fat guy with a big neck. Yes, so does that go in axis one or three? Good. So obstructive sleep apnea is an axis three diagnosis. Breathing-related sleep disorder is the axis one. That's the uh, psychiatric condition. Uh, the, diagno the diagnosis, you probably remember from first or second year, you need a polysomnogram and you need more than 10 hypoapnic or apneic events per hour. And then the treatment is a CPAP. Uh, first lose weight, but that usually doesn't happen, so then you do a CPAP. Um, and the major complication of this is pulmonary hypertension. So um, that is why we treat it. So our last patient has irresistible attacks of refreshing REM sleep. Upon intense emotion, they lose muscle tone or have hallucinations as waking or falling asleep. Oops, typo. What does that sound like? Narcolepsy. It does sound like narcolepsy. So remember, you can't just have these sleep attacks. Oops. You can't just have the sleep attacks. You do need one of these other criteria, either cataplexy, which is falling down when you uh, have intense emotion, or these hypnagogic or hypnopopic hallucinations as you're going to sleep or waking up. So these little sleep attacks alone aren't diagnostic in and of themselves. And scheduled naps and modafinil are the treatment for that. Okay, so we've got a 30-year-old man and his wife. Ooh, typo. Uh, they present for couples counseling. He constantly accuses her of cheating. He's in a feud with the neighbor because he feels they are attacking his character when they say they like his flower beds. That's kind of weird. Paranoid what? Personality disorder. So this is paranoid personality disorder. Um, and this is one of the personality disorders that you can treat with a low-dose antipsychotic because the characteristics, the paranoia, um, are a, a pseudo-psychotic symptom. So what about a 30-year-old man, never been married, doesn't have any close friends, works as a security guard, and in his free time works in model, on model ships in his basement? Is it schizoid or schizotypal? Schizoid. So they're schizoid, they're just a little odd, um, don't really want friends, that's kind of weird. Schizotypal, I think of like a type of schizophrenia, so typal type of schizophrenia, I don't know. That's how I kept it straight. Um, schizotypal personality disorder really has more in common. A lot of people feel that it's on the spectrum of schizophrenia. They have these really weird interests, um, kind of like magical thinking. Usually it ends, you know, it has to do with either magic or talking to animals or witchcraft or something like that. So um, the difference between schizoid personality disorder schizotypal, and then frank schizophrenia is a pretty commonly tested subject. So, questions about that? Fair enough. 
We've got a 25-year-old man comes to court-mandated counseling for beating his girlfriend, was kicked out of high school for fighting, and just got out of jail for stealing for a car. Winner, right? So this is antisocial personality disorder. And the um, most common comorbid condition is substance abuse, and that makes sense. So that's something you would either check a UA or ask about substance use history uh, because it's a really common comorbid condition. So what about the girlfriend of this guy? Has a history of unstable relationships, super, superficial cuts on both risks, is impulsive in her spending, and sexual practices. That's borderline. And the most common defense mechanism used? Splitting, good. I got asked about that. Everyone says it's going to be on the test, and it always is. So splitting is the most common defense mechanism for borderline personality disorder. Uh, we've got a 26-year-old MS2 asked by Nan Claire to seek counseling. Her classmates complain that she dresses too provocatively to class. She recently tried to seduce a, a professor. True story. I'm just kidding, it's not. <laughs> but what does she have? Histrionic. Very good. Um, most common comorbid conditions here, substance abuse again, or an eating disorder. Again, attention seeking, usually bulimia, is um, coexisting with histrionic. So we've got a 22-year-old MS1. He doesn't feel like he needs to come to any classes or labs because he already has the brilliance to be a doctor. He refuses to talk to Nan Claire about this, instead insisting to deal directly with President Henrich. Narcissistic, very good. So this one, the differential, um, can be tricky with a hypomanic episode because of the grandiosity. So um, that's the thing to keep on your differential. Uh, and the specific thing to remember about treating narcissistic personality disorder is to some extent you kind of have to buy into their narcissism. Oh, you're so special. Let's have some therapy about it. And they don't do well in group therapy. So individual therapy is a better way to go. Any questions for me? You just like my vignettes? Okay. Got to keep you awake somehow. It's two hours. Okay, so we got a 30 year old woman. She's got no friends, avoids happy hours with her coworkers because she fears ridicule, ridicule and rejection. She feels no one would want to be friends with me. We've seen her before. She's avoidant personality disorder. So um, they have some symptoms similar to social phobia, so you can treat those with a beta blocker or SSRI. Um, but it's different from social phobia. How? How is it different? So it's more pervasive. Somebody with social phobia could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but they couldn't be here giving you guys this presentation. So it's really the being the center of attention, giving a presentation, being um, observed, so to speak, that causes the anxiety, not just interaction with one or two people. Okay, so 30-year-old woman has jumped from one relationship to another because she doesn't do well alone. She calls her friends and family 20 times a day to get their input on her daily decisions. But I mean, who doesn't? So, I don't know. What does she have? Dependent. So she's dependent personality disorder. Um, and the comorbid condition to remember here is depression or anxiety. And if those are present, you treat those. There's not really a treatment for the actual um, personality disorder itself. What? Cut the cord. Oh, so these can be difficult patients to treat in psychotherapy. Yes, definitely. Okay, so our last patient, a 25-year-old MS4, spends more time color coding her notes and textbook highlighting than actually studying. Again, who doesn't? She makes lists and study schedules three times a day. Um, people don't like to work with her because she's so anal. OCPD, right? Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder. And the big distinguishing factor between this and OCD Yes, very good. I heard egocentric. So um, these people are not bothered by their compulsions. So the highlighting, the organizing, the yada, 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 um, it doesn't bother them. They don't see anything wrong with it. It's egocentric. In OCD, uh, they recognize that there's a problem, but they can't stop. Yes, sir. How would you get the syntonic versus dystonic differential here from what you've worked? I, I mean, I'm not trying to take apart your question. You no, no. no well, I mean, you are, but. You're, you're right. Um, let's see. It, I don't give you enough information. It's not that I give you information to rule out OCD. It's that I don't give you enough information to diagnose it. I don't say that this interferes with her um, grades. You know, usually, actually, people with OCPD 
do fine in their functioning. It's just they have problems. That's with all personality disorders. They have problems with their interpersonal relationships. So if this were a vignette for OCD, it would have to tell you, and she's worried by this. Uh, it's interfering with her grades, um, so forth and so on. So I could have said, I could have added a sentence at the end here, um, and she's proud of her uh, stringent ways. That may have cemented it, but. Sure. I think if you saw this on the test, you would be safe to call it OCPD because um, you don't have enough information to call it OCD. Okay. So, and actually, the egosyntonism is not in the diagnostic criteria. If you look at the DSM-4, I think, I think I've given you enough here. So what, one way to tell the difference is whether it's egosyntonic or egodystonic, but that's not in the DSM. Okay. So we got an old lady. She is brought in from her nursing home for altered mental status. She sleeps more during the day and becomes agitated at night. And she reports that she sees little green men in the corner and complain, complains of pain upon urination. What are we thinking of? Delirium. And what's our first step? Yes, medical workup. And in this case, what's the first best test for her? A UA, right? This is probably her UTI that's triggered her delirium. So medical workup in general, um, if the vignette gives you enough information to direct what that medical workup is, pick that. Um, things that commonly cause delirium in the elderly, drug interactions. So look for things like Benadryl, benzos, opiates, and uh, look for electrolyte abnormalities like hyponatremia, hypernatremia. Um, infection is a huge one. Um, B12 deficiency or syphilis are more rare, but possible causes of delirium. So what is the biggest risk factor for delirium? It's not infection. If I give you two choices, one of your choices is uh, underlying dementia, and one of your choices is advanced age. advanced age. Uh, you always want to pick underlying dementia because there's something already wrong with their brain, but the biggest risk factor for developing delirium um, is advanced age. Dementia is second. Other common causes of delirium? So we got sepsis already. Um, the one thing I don't have indicated in my medical workup is substance withdrawal. Particularly think about this if the person is younger, uh, they may tell you about somebody who's in for surgery, like an appendectomy or something, and they weren't expecting to be in the hospital. So on day three, they can have delirium induced by either benzo withdrawal or more frequently alcohol withdrawal. Um, and EEG findings of delirium. This is how you can distinguish it from psychosis. Because this lady is having hallucinations. It's a psychotic symptom. How do we tell if she's delirious or psychotic? Slow waves, very good. So the EEG has diffuse background slowing in delirium. And in acute psychosis, even though they're all crazy and stuff, their EEG is actually normal. So that's one way we can tell the difference. And treatment of delirium? So you got to fix whatever's wrong. Um, and then while you're doing the workup or while you're doing that, you want to make sure that you give them a room near the nurse's station, you make it dark during the nighttime and light during the daytime, orient them with clocks and calendars, invite their families to come in. Um, and if only if they're really agitated or a threat to themselves do you use a, a typical antipsychotic, like how, how occurred all. Okay, so now we've got another old lady presenting with memory loss, but this lady uh, has aphasia, apraxia, and gets lost while she's driving. What type of dementia is this? Alzheimer's, most common. So if you don't know what dementia it is, you're safer picking Alzheimer's just because it's the most common type. Um, and remember, on your mini mental status exam, they can't remember the three objects that you tell them. And even when you help them, you give them the category or give them prompting, they still can't remember. Uh, so pathology of Alzheimer's dementia, what, what might you see on an MRI or a CT? Yes, and it's diffuse. That's how you tell it from a different type of dementia. Um, and what would you see on pathology? 
Yeah, tau tangles, beta amyloid plaques. Yep, got to think way back, way back to pathology. Nan Claire, okay. Mm -hmm. So the amyloid, in addition to making plaques on the neurons, can also cause deposition in the walls of the arteries. Uh, it's called amy amyloid angi angiopathy, and it's a cause of brain bleeds in elderly. Mm -hmm. All amyloid is birefringent, apple green. Okay, so the genes for Alzheimer's. Did I hear APP? Amyloid precursor protein, and that's on chromosome... 21, very good. That's why people with Down syndrome have an earlier onset of Alzheimer's because alpha, am, uh, alpha amyloid precursor protein is on chromosome 21. And there's also this APOE E2 allele that causes an um, effect on Alzheimer's. Best treatment? Rivastigmine is one. So that what type of drug is that? It's an anticholinesterase inhibitor, so it increases the amount of acetylcholine in the synapse. So that helps some. Rivastigmine, um, and then there are two other ones, galantamine, and denepazil is the big one. That's Aricept. So all of these acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, since they give you more acetylcholine, can cause diarrhea. Um, that's why a lot of elderly people can't tolerate them. Memantine is newer on the horizon. It's Nemenda. That's the... Um, brand name for it. Does anybody know how memantine works? What? Yes, it's an NMDA. I think it's an agonist, though. I think it's an NMDA agonist. Let's check who can get there before I can. I think we want to decrease excitability, so we would, oh, you guys are right. It's a blocker, very good. It's an NMDA antagonist for those reasons. So remember glutinate, glu, glutamate is excite, can cause uh, neurotoxicity, so it makes it excitatory. So we block it and the thought is that it can prevent some damage and help um, prevent the rate of decline. So none of these medicines will improve memory, but they can prevent the rate of decline uh, most effectively if given early in the course of the disease. So what if we have the same patient who has memory loss, but they also become more sexually explicit and apathetic? That's frontotemporal, right? Because your frontal lobes um, deal with your kind of processing and planning. So Pick's disease is the other word for that. Um, Pathology, what does their brain look like on MRI? It's frontotemporal atrophy, right? It's not entire brain atrophy. Um, and these have pick bodies, which are in the neurons themselves and their silver staining inclusions. I don't know if they'll get that nitpicky with the pathology, uh, but there you go, in case they do. And the treatment for Pick's disease. So we treat the disinhibition. Usually these patients' families are disturbed because grandma has taken off her shirt at the Thanksgiving table. Um, it's the behavioral problems that are, are causing a disruption in the life, not necessarily the memory loss itself. So we treat the behavioral problems, and olanzapine is the safest drug to do that. Um, fluctuations in consciousness, visual hallucinations, and shuffling gait. Lewy body dementia. I had a patient with this at the VA. So they've got symptoms of Parkinsonism. It can be tricky to tell this from Parkinson's dementia, um, but they also have hallucinations, and the fluctuations in consciousness is really key. So Lewy body dementia is kind of a combination. It's got some aspects of delirium. It's got some aspects of Parkinsonism, um, and it's the two together. So this is Lewy body dementia. The pathology involves Lewy bodies, which are alpha sinuculin inclusions in the cortex. And treatment for this, what do we not give them? We shouldn't give them alcohol, fair enough. Also, we shouldn't give them typical antipsychotics. One of the characteristics of Lewy body dementia is a um, paradoxical reaction to antipsychotics. So if you give them haloperidol or benzos sometimes, um, it can cause them to become more psychotic and more uh, 
uh, delirious. So we treat the memory loss here. We give them the same agents as with Alzheimer's disease. We don't give them levodopa, again, for the same reason. It's going to make their hallucinations worse. And we don't give them neuroleptics because they have a paradoxic relation to them. And I saw that with my friend at the VA. Okay, so still an old lady with memory loss. But now her memory loss comes in sudden stepwise decreases in memory and cognition. So that makes us think vascular. And we do a vascular workup, MRI, MRA, blah, blah, blah. Um, what if we had a patient with memory loss who also had a loss of vibration sense, labile affect, pupils that accommodate and do not react? It's tertiary syphilis. So to diagnose it, we first check in our PR, um, but you always have to do a spinal tap. If it's starting to cause neurologic symptoms, you've got to check and see if there are spirochetes in the CSF because the treatment is different. If it's just regular syphilis, you can give them penicillin, uh, no problem. If it's neurosyphilis, it needs to be IV, uh, and it can only be penicillin. So even if they're penallergic, you desensitize, the, des desensitize them, um, give them IV penicillin. I think it's for four to six weeks, maybe even 10. It's a long course of penicillin. All right, so what if our patient, still with memory loss, now also has monoclonus, myoclonus, uh, increased startle response, and seizures? And in history, recently had a corneal transplant. Kreutzfeldt Jakob, so random that it's in psychiatry, but it is. So myoclonus is the key. That's um, a myoclonic jerk. Usually it's of the arm. And the corneal transplant, because that's a risk factor, right? So transplantation of corneal tissue can transmit the disease. Um, pathology here is called spongiform encephalopathy. That would, that's what you would see on pathologic slides. And EEG findings? Someone want to be a rock star? How about you, Harlingen? Triphasic bursts. That's what you were going to say, right? Or did you? I cut you off. Anyway, triphasic bursts are the EEG finding. So if you hear that or read that, automatically Kreutzfeldt Jakob, prion disease. Uh, our same patient with memory loss also has incontinence, gait disturbance, falling all the time, um, and the dementia develops a little more rapidly. Yes, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So um, they got a drunken sailor walk, uh, incontinent, and demented. So good. To diagnose if it's normal pressure hydrocephalus, we've got to see the hydrocephalus, right, on an MRI, and we have to prove that it's normal pressure. So MRI and spinal tap are the workup there. And treatment? Shunt, right? This is a nice kind of dementia to have if you have to pick one because it's pretty easily reversible with surgery. What? I, no, it's different ladies. Different ladies. All right, so now let's talk about some boozers. 50-year-old known alcoholic presents to the ER tonic-clonic seizures. Blood pressure is high, heart rate is high, temperature is high. How long has it been since his last drink? Less, less. So um, there, there's a bimodal peak. Average, it's between 12 to 24 hours, but there is peaks at 8 and then at 48. That's how the average gets to be 12 to 24. So, um, so that's that. How about confusion? How long until he starts developing confusion, delirium, uh, formication, which is the feeling of ants crawling on you? How long till that starts to develop? Yeah, 48 to 72 is usually when we start worrying about DTs. That's why when you admit somebody for alcohol detox, you've at least got to watch them till 72, um, preferably a day longer than that. So if we check his blood alcohol level and it's 225, how long till it's out of their system? So alcohol has what type of kinetics? Zero order. Um, and if it's about 25 milligrams an hour, I've seen 20 or 25. I'll use 25 here because it makes my math easier. Um, it's got to divide by 25. And you get 9, I think, if you do the math. So uh, just remember that alcohol is metabolized by zero order kinetics. So if you've got a buttload of alcohol in your system, it's going to take longer than if you have less. So zero order kinetics is a certain amount of drug metabolized per unit time, not a certain percentage. All right. So 
if this, this drunk guy uh, has medications including propranolol, lactulose, allopurinol, what would be the best sign to monitor his withdrawals? Ooh, this is a dirty question, but it's good. So propranolol is going to blunt the tachycardia, right? So we can't watch the tachycardia. Um, so what can we watch? Uh, that just makes you poo a lot. Mm, it only it only helps because in uremia it helps uh, uh, mental status in uremia because it binds the toxin. I'll just tell you. Uh, no, because remember beta blockers will help that too. That's why we take it for social anxiety. It's reflex hyperreflexia. So another sign, one of the signs of autonomic instability is hyperactive reflexes. So if you're blunting all the other signs, the hyperactive reflexes will still be there. I got a question about it. That's why I put it on. But I think it's kind of a dirty question. So, okay. Best in initial treatment for our uh, delirious patient, our alcohol withdrawal patient. What should we give them? Oh, man. Libri and what is that? Because Librium will not be on your test. Chlorodiazepoxide. <laughs> oh, no. Chlorodiazepoxide or diazepam. So Librium or Valium, uh, diazepam or chlorodiazepoxide are really long in terms of half-lives. So it's um, effective for withdrawal. And uh, second PowerPoint, so I've given you the answer to my second question. If the patient has liver failure, lorazepam, oxazepam, and temazepam are the benzos of choice to you. So they spell LOT. I think probably first aid says that. L-O-T. These are ones that, um, that are safer for patients in liver failure. I think because they're glucuronidated and not metabolized a different way. Uh, but either way, these are the ones that are preferred both in elderly patients um, and in patients with liver failure. The most specific test to measure um, alcohol consumption in the past 10 days? GTT, um, or GGT, is a good one. There's one that's more specific. What? Oh, there's one that's more specific, and it's called carbohydrate-deficient transferrin. I got pimped on this on the consult service at UH, and I looked it up, and it's true. Um, but I didn't see it on the test. On the test, you know, if there's not this carbohydrate random one, pick GGT. That's probably the one that you'll, you'll want. But I got pimped on it. You probably won't happen to use. This is your last week, but there you go. You can sound smart. Also remember the old trick with LFTs that if AST is more than uh, twice that of ALT, that's another indication of alcoholic liver problems. Okay, so the next patient comes in, confusion, ataxia, and this on physical exam. He's trying to look. He's trying to look this way. Look this way. I can't. I can't. So that's ophthalmoplegia. So he's got ophthalmoplegia, confusion, and ataxia. Wernicke's, very good. So ataxia, confusion, and either jiggly eyes or paralyzed eyes. So those are the findings of Wernicke's encephalopathy. This is a thymine problem. So remember if a drunk person or an uh, alcoholic person comes into the ER, always thymine first before glucose because giving glucose without thymine because of all that biochemistry stuff I've long forgotten. You can't utilize the glucose unless you have the thymine as a cofactor. So glucose before thymine worsens. The encephalopathy. So always thiamine first. And it can progress to Cor Korsakoff syndrome, um, at which point it becomes irreversible. So Wernicke's encephalopathy is reversible with um, the administration of thiamine. Korsakoff syndrome is irreversible. And it's a problem with the mammillary bodies. You guys all remember this business from neuroscience first year, I'm sure. So uh, the problem is the, the amnesia becomes uh, unreversible, irreversible in Korsakoff's. Okay, so we've got a patient. He's brought into the ER, non-responsive. Blood pressure is low. Heart rate is low. Respiratory rate is low. Lots of track marks on his arms. What are we thinking? Sounds like heroin. Sounds like her 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 uh, opiate overdose. And what's our best first step here? You want to give naloxone first? Yeah, that's, that's the kicker. Respiratory rate is six, right? Under eight intubate. So um, always, always check ABCs, even in psychiatry. So this guy um, is unstable. He's non-responsive, and his respiratory rate is really low. So we've got to intubate him first, but naloxone will be shortly thereafter. 
So um, check your ABCs first. Then naloxone is the next best treatment. Um, then you realize the pupils are dilated. Do we expect that in a person who's overdosed on heroin? Do we expect dilated pupils? In withdrawal, right? But this guy, I mean, his, his respiratory depression, I mean, he's intoxicated with heroin, but his pupils are dilated. That's, that's a good thought, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, cause respiratory depression. PCP wouldn't cause respiratory depression. What I'm, what I'm getting at here, it's still heroin overdose, but if he's severely hypoxic from his respiratory suppression, hypoxia can cause pupil dilation. So, I know, stinky question. If I gave you all ones you knew the answer to, you wouldn't need to be here. So, hypoxia can cause um, dilation of pupils. Uh, and symptoms you expect as he starts to withdraw? Juicy, nice. So everything gets a little bit wet, right? You get some diarrhea, you get some rhinorrhea, uh, you sweat. It hurts, right? Joint and muscle pain. That's why people don't like to withdraw from heroin. Kind of sucks, I've heard. Um, and goosebumps, that's another one. I dilated pupils. I think we got the rest of those. How do we treat um, heroin withdrawal? How? If they're being admitted for, uh, for detox or being admitted for withdrawals, we don't give them methadone. Couldn't give them a benzo, but usually it's just symptomatic treatment. So clonidine is the best for the autonomic symptoms. Um, it helps their hypertension and all that business. Um, Lopiramide can be symptomatic treatment for diarrhea. You can use some of these methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone for long-term dependence. Um, but if they're there for detox, you wouldn't want to do that. You just treat them symptomatically. So I did a lot of reading on this because uh, I was kind of confused when I was making this slide. What I've seen in like the psychiatric literature, or the psychiatric guidelines, are that if they're there for something else, like if they're there for their gallbladder being taken out and they happen to withdraw, you put them on methadone. But if they're there to withdraw and get off heroin, um, or they're there being treated for uh, dependence and withdrawal, then you treat them symptomatically. I don't think they'll give you a question that asks you to tease apart those intricacies. Okay, so more people on fun substances. Now we've got a patient with horizontal nystagmus, dilated pupils, ataxia, and acute psychosis. Yeah, it sounds like PCP. So the nystagmus gives it away. Dilated pupils could be a lot of things, could be cocaine, amphetamines, but if they've got nystagmus, think about PCP. Uh, and these people tend to be psychotic, so remember your haloperidol. If the patient uh, presents after a motor vehicle collision, they've got injected conjunctiva, sedated, and they're asking for Doritos. Yes, good job. Patient presents with um, suicidal ideation, hypersomnia, depression, and energia. Cocaine, Cocaine withdrawal. Very good. Um, patient presents with dilated pupils, seizure, tachycardia, and hypertension. Ooh, that's good. What if I told you they're intoxicated with something? Cocaine or amphetamines is what I was going for, but you guys um, gave valid answers from what, that, from what I said. Uh, what's our best first test for cocaine or amphetamine intoxication? Good. Um, we need a urintoxine to diagnose it, but if they're coming in intoxicated, remember, we got to look at what's going to kill the patient first. And people with cocaine or amphetamine intoxication can have arrhythmias, so it's good to do an EKG first and then we confirm that they're um, on drugs. So if they have a seizure, because seizures can be um, an effective intoxication, you can treat that with a benzo. But how do we treat hypertension in someone who's on cocaine? We don't. We avoid beta blockers for sure, because these peeps who are taking cocaine, right, they've got norepinephrine out the wazoo. So if we give them a drug that blocks all the beta receptors, where's it going to go? alpha receptors, and they're going to get hypertensive crisis, stroke, and death. So no beta blockers for people on cocaine. Treat them with something else. Calcium channel blockers, maybe an alpha blocker or something else, but not beta blocker. Okay, so childhood development. I'm going to go kind of fast here, but make sure you, you look at it. <laughs> um, let me just put them all up. We'll talk about the big ones. Oh, no. Okay. 
So um, I think the ones that I remember seeing most often were the Piaget, um, the Erickson, the Erickson conflicts. I don't remember seeing that, but it's in all of the books. When you start reading about child psych, it always starts with these childhood development things. Um, what I would remember is the time when death is permanent is usually six to seven years. That's where the concrete operational phase starts. Um, and the ability to think abstractly begins at age 11. That's when formal operational starts. So the difference between pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational, formal operational, I remember being important on my shelf. Um, but this stuff is in all the child psych books, so I figured I'd throw it up here. OK, let's do a question. An 11-year-old boy is evaluated for developmental delay, poor school and social performance. Formal IQ testing reveals his IQ to be 50. He has macrocephaly, long face, and macro orchidism. What degree of mental retardation does he have? Moderate. So remember, um, what's the average IQ? And what's the standard deviation? 15. So average IQ is 100. Standard deviation is 15. Um, and at two standard deviations below, that's the upper limit of mild. And then it's in 15 increments. So 70 to 55 is mild, 55 to 40 is moderate, 40 to 25 is severe, and below 25 is profound. Those are important numbers to remember. Um, where does this go on the DSM-4? Axis 2, very good, with the personality disorders, right? Personality disorders and mental retardation go on axis 2. And the most likely cause in this kid's case? Fragile X, very good. So remember, this is X-linked. Um, it's one of the uh, tricyclic repeat disorders, and it anticipates, which means it gets worse uh, as the generations progress. Um, and it's the most common cause of inherited mental retardation. It's more common than Down syndrome in terms of inherited mental retardation. Okay, so what about our newborn baby? Decreased tone, oblique palpebral fissures, semi-increased big tongue, white spots on his iris. What does that sound like? Downs. What are the white spots on the iris called? 10 bonus points. Brush field spots, who cares? Okay, so this is Down syndrome. What can we tell his mom about his expected IQ? What range of mental retardation does Down syndrome have on average? It's usually mild to moderate. So it's typically not uh, severe or profound, although it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, and she should expect delay in most of his developmental milestones. Uh, in terms of common medical complications, again, here are the medical questions they can ask you in psychiatry. What happens to the heart? Very good. Endocardial cushion defects is the most common cardiovascular abnormality. GI? Duodenal atresia, Hirschsprung's, and perforated anus annular pancreas, which causes the obstruction in the intestine as well. Endocrine abnormalities? Similar to lithium? Good, hypothyroidism. Musculoskeletal problems. This one's kind of random. They can have atlanoaxial instability, uh, which is important to know if you're going to intubate them, like in anesthesia. Um, neurological problems. They get what kind of dementia early? Alzheimer's because of APP on chromosome 21. And any cancer risk increased for them? Oh, this was on step one. You guys should know this. ALL. They have a 10 times increased risk of ALL. Okay. So um, more medical causes of mental retardation. This was the hardest part of child psych for me, just because there's a lot of details to keep straight. So if you see in the um, vignette, cafe au lait spot, seizures, big head, and it's an autosomal dominant trait. Neurofibromatosis. If there are coarse facies, short stature, cloudy cornea. Autosomal recessive. This is biochem, biteness in the butt right here. Very good, hurlers. Ten bonus points for you. Uh, broad square face, short stature, self-injurious behavior, and it's caused by a deletion in chromosome 17. Kind of a random one. Smith McGinnis. It was in the child psych book. I'm sorry. Um, this is in Lang. These, these I read. The child psych book that I read was Lang. 
Okay, hypotonia, hypogonadism, hyperphagia, skin picking, aggression, and the deletion is on parental chromosome 15. Prater Willie, seizure, strabismus, sociable with episodic laughter, much like a happy puppet. Deletion on maternal chromosome 15. Angelman, elfin appearance, friendly, increased empathy, verbal reasoning ability, deletion on chromosome 7. Williams, oh, you guys are good. ADHD like symptoms, macrocephaly, smooth philtrum most common cause of mental retardation. Very good, fetal alcohol syndrome. Seizures, chorioretinitis, hearing impairment, periventricular calcifications, petechiae at birth, and hepatitis. It's one of the torch infections, CMB. Um, seizures, hearing impairment, cloudy cornea, retinitis, heart defects, and low birth weight. Another torch infection, rubella. Abnormal muscle tone, unsteady gait, seizures, mental retardation, or learning disability. I don't even remember what this one is. Oh, cerebral palsy. So remember, um, birth asphyxia or um, birth trauma, birth problems can cause hypoxia. And that's actually a very common cause of both behavioral problems, learning disabilities, and mental retardation in children. So these are all signs of upper motor neuron type problems with the contraction, unsteady gait, abnormal tone. Okay, what about this little friend? Intrauterine growth restriction, hypertonia, distinctive facies that I've got on the PowerPoint, limb malformation, self-injurious behavior, and they're hyperactive. I saw a kid like this in child psych clinic. Cornelia de Lange. Um, coloboma, oh, so this is an association, that's CHARGE. The CHARGE association is also, um, has mental retardation associated with it. Autism spectrum, and the rest of these with a chromosome 22 deletion. De George, vomiting seizures, lethargy coma, acidosis with stress. Sounds like biochem again. Have they officially combined the diagnosis of deleterious um, I, I think they're interchangeable, last I remember from pediatrics, but I don't know. So, um, oh, this is annoying. All right, so exclusively in girls, hand wringing, X link dominant. Brett's good. Normal development until age two. Then a major loss of verbal social skills with autistic like behavior. Good. So it's childhood disintegrative disorder because they lose milestones. So normal development and then regression. Um, lack of mother-child eye contact, language delay, and repetitive language. They're preoccupied with parts of toys like the little wheel that spins, and it occurs before age three. Good. Autism. Problems with social skills, usually not recognized till preschool, but they've got oh, preserved, not reserved, preserved verbal ability. That's Asperger's. Okay, good. You'll see a question on that in terms of um, developmental problems. So we've got a seven-year-old boy brought in by his parents, report that he must be told several times to complete his chores. They cannot get him to focus on completing his homework. He's easily distracted, and he often loses his shoes, pencils, books, etc. Do we have enough to diagnose ADHD? The way I asked it, right? Loaded question. So that's the hardest part about these questions, is you'll always see ADHD as an answer choice, and another answer choice will be normal age-appropriate behavior. So that's the hardest distinction to figure out. So do we have enough to diagnose ADHD here? Do we know anything about how he is at school? We don't, right? So here, we just see that he's meeting some of the criteria, but only in one setting. We need two settings to diagnose ADHD. So um, diagnosis, as of now, normal age-appropriate behavior. We don't have enough to diagnose ADHD. Next best, next best step, let's see how he does at school. Because if he's just um, exhibiting these same types of symptoms in the school environment, we might have enough for diagnosis. Risk factors for ADHD? It's it's uh, heritable, so family history plays a role. Also, um, low birth weight babies tend to have more ADHD. Tobacco and ethanol use in utero leads to ADHD. Comorbid conditions with ADHD? Learning disabilities, true. Um, and ODD and CD later on. That's the more common comorbid condition. And then treatment, all these drugs, right? So methylphenidate, um, amphetamines, amoxetine, estratera, and then there are some randoms. So here they are. Methylphenidate um, is 
like Concerta or Ritalin, and it works by blocking dopamine reuptake. The side effects for this and for Adderall and other amphetamines are decreased appetite, uh, increased heart rate and blood pressure, anything you would expect from an amphetamine. The mechanism of Adderall is only different in that it also blocks norepinephrine um, reuptake and stimulates release, so just like the mechanism of ac action of the drug or like cocaine. Um, um, Atomoxetine is a newer drug. Um, it's a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, and it's the only one that's a non-stimulant, but it still does cause dry mouth and insomnia and will decrease appetite a little bit, but it has less of the um, problems like with the teenagers selling their Ritalin on the street. So that's what atomoxetine is good for as far as I've been able to tell. Um, some blood pressure medications can be used for ADHD, but this is like third or fourth line, clonidine or guaifenesin. Um, and they've got the side effects of clonidine and guafenacin. And some antidepressants can help, again, by preventing reuptake. It's preserving more norepinephrine, um, but they're the same side effects as when these drugs are used as antidepressants. So only a couple more slides. A 14-year-old boy is sent for court-mandated counseling. He stole his neighbor's lawnmower and then set fire to his tool shed. It's a nice kid. Uh, he has a five-year history of truancy from school and assaulted a 13-year-old schoolmate. What does this kid have? Conduct disorder. Very good. So remember the timing here is important. They need symptoms for six months. Um, look out for comorbid substance abuse in these children and look out for them to progress to antisocial personality disorder. Um, our second patient, a 14-year-old boy brought in by his grandmother. For the past year, he's been getting into trouble at school for being argumentative, disrespectful, defies the rules that she sets for him in the house, and often deliberately annoys her. ODD, so opposite, oppositional defiant disorder. Uh, so this is another one that can be a little bit tricky between age-appropriate behavior and ODD, because all teenagers are a little bit a pain in the butt. Um, deliberately annoying, this kind of pervasive disrespect for rules and guidelines in multiple settings are things to tip you off. Uh, but if it sounds really, really mild, you know, like the kid doesn't want to clean his room or he talks back or uh, doesn't pick up his stuff, look for the answer choice normal age appropriate behavior and, and that could be right if you don't have enough of the diagnostic criteria to diagnose ODD. Okay, so a few more. A nine-year-old boy is sent to counseling at the recommendation of his teacher. She states that at least once a day he makes loud grunting noises and hand movements that are disruptive to class. What's that? Tourette's, very good. Um, to call them Tourette's in, a, in contrast to just tics, they've got to happen fairly frequently. Uh, DSM-4 says at least once a day for a year with no tic-free period lasting longer than three months to meet full diagnostic criteria. Comorbid conditions we talked about already they're more likely to develop OCD. And treatment here, it's tricky, because there's, there's a difference, whether they ask you for first line or they ask you for most effective. Most effective is haloperidol. That's definitely the most effective treatment. First line is actually clonidine, because it's got um, a more favorable side effect profile. So read the question very carefully. Okay, um, seven-year-old, Frequent abdominal pain, misses a lot of school, uh, never gets the pain on the weekends or the summer. Separation anxiety. Six-year-old adopted child brought in because she's not formed a relationship with her adoptive parents. She's inhibited and hypervigilant. It's reactive attachment disorder. So it usually happens with um, problems in early infancy where the patient or the child doesn't have their needs met consistently by the caregiver. 18-month-old um, baby recently regurgitating and rechewing her food has previously been eating normally. There was a pretest question on this that I missed, so I put it in here. It's called rumination disorder. Very good. Um, and you check the lead levels because they're eating. They usually eat random stuff too with the pica, so they are prone to lead poisoning. Um, okay, so we've got a six-year-old stools in her clothes once every two weeks. Next best test for her. What's a common medical cause of anachoparesis? Constipation. So we want to check for fecal retention there um, because it could be leakage of the diarrhea around the impacted stool. And the treatment, 
Um, once we've ruled out medical causes, behavioral modification, but only rewards. You never want to punish a child for, um, for stooling inappropriately, because that can lead to, if you believe Freud, can lead to some anal retentive tendencies in adults. So, um, six-year-old who urinates in her clothes once a day at nighttime. Next best test. So that'd be diagnosis. What do we want to rule out medically? UTI. So we want to make sure she doesn't have a UTI, and then we treat with behavioral therapy. The alarm and pad works, and then there are some drug therapies you can use if behavioral modification doesn't help. And that's it. So we got it all done in two hours. Um, thanks for sticking around. Hopefully it was helpful, and I wish you guys the best of luck on your shelf exam on Friday. Thanks. Stick around if you have questions. Um.